We've got our Bibles open in Daniel chapter 11, and uh, just reading it through, we thank our brother Phil for getting through it beyond verse 37, all the way to verse 39. Um, it's a tough old chapter, isn't it? It, it? It's not an easy one. We don't sit there and go, oh, we got this sorted out, this is, this is a doddle. It's hard work. It takes some concentration, doesn't it, to sort of even follow it through let alone really know what it is that the chapter is talking to us about. But it's an amazing chapter, because it gives to us, in the most extraordinary detail, the major conflict between particularly the kings of the north and of the south in the Middle East. In fact, the detail is so exceptional that Bible critics simply insist that it has to be written after its time. It, it, it couldn't have been written by Daniel. It had to be written after the events that are detailed within the chapter because it is simply so phenomenally accurate. Now, you, you'll be thrilled to know that we're not about to go verse by verse uh, as an exposition. For that, I'd re refer you to verse by verse verse, right? Uh, um, and I would suggest to you that's a really excellent book if you want to go through in detail um, uh, Brother First Mansfield, actually, that the brethren after him picked up, I think he got to about Daniel 9 or 10, but they used the references within his margins to finish the exposition of Daniel. And I'd say that's an excellent book if you want to try to pick out the detail from each verse. We're going to try to sort of pick out a few bits and pieces to support us uh, in our thinking this evening. Let's begin by asking ourselves the question, why it is that we have this chapter on the divine record? We don't need to ask that question, do we, around Daniel chapter 2. We know it very well. The head of gold and young people, boys, it's great to see you there listening so well. The head of gold, you remember, is Babylon, right? The, the Medes and the Persians, the, the, the silver. Uh, were the, 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 the silver were the Medes and the Persians, the, the Greeks, the, 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 the brass of Nebuchadnezzar's image, the legs of iron, the Romans. And we see that, don't we, paralleled in Daniel chapter 7, where we see the beasts, uh, the, the, the lion of the Babylonians. We then see the bear, don't we, lifted up on one side with three ribs in its mouth as the Medes and the Persians. We see the leopard with four wings moving at great pace, as the Greeks, uh, and we see a great and terrible beast that comes after of the Roman Empire. And then in Daniel chapter 8, we don't need reminding, do we, that we see more beasts again that build on what we saw in Daniel chapter 7. As history starts to unfold, those beasts are focused, aren't they, on the Medes and the Persians, the, the ram, and then the, the goat, the he-goat, that moved at terrific pace we see the Greek Empire. So what is Daniel chapter 11? What, does, what is it that Daniel chapter 11 adds to us? Well, it gives the most enormous and extraordinary detail about the, the geopolitical circumstances of the day after the Medes and Persians and particularly into the time of the Greeks. You've got to remember that it's a prophecy about a period of time that we know very little about. We've known the history of Israel up to this point, haven't we? We've got stories of men and women in Babylon, even in the times of the Medes and Persians, like Daniel chapter 6, and the Jews going back to the land, and Nehemiah, Ezra, and company, and Esther. But Daniel chapter 11, we don't have any prophecies alongside it. There's no stories that help us in piecing together this record. In fact, it's a time of great darkness. Keep a marker. Obviously, it's our base chapter. But will you come to, to Amos? In Amos chapter 8, We read about the darkness that would come upon the land of Israel. Verse 11 of Amos chapter 8. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. Just, just come to Micah, uh, to, to, to build on this picture, picture that we're seeing, of a period in history when God would no longer be speaking with the nation. Micah chapter 3. We read in verse 6. Therefore night shall be unto you, that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, that ye shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, but there is no answer of God. And so the prophets, Amos and Micah particularly there that we've seen, have told the nation that there would come a time of darkness, of spiritual darkness, where the words of the Lord would not go out. There would be silence in the land of Israel. A dark cloud would sit over the nation. And for the faithful, they were able to read certain prophecies. Daniel chapter 9 would be telling them about the time when Messiah would come. But that was 490 years after the decree to build Jerusalem. So when we think about it, we're talking about a period of about half a millennium of spiritual darkness. When there is no sounds from the prophets. And it's at that period in history that the faithful would keep reading Daniel chapter 11. Because this prophecy, in the most extraordinary detail, would keep showing them that it is God who rules in the kingdoms of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. Come back to Daniel chapter 11. And we see a key word in our chapter, which is a key word in the book of Daniel, is the Hebrew word, Ahmad, which is translated stand. Now, as a primary school teacher, I'm used to a room like this, but I'm normally sat and stood in front of a group of young people, children, and I'm saying to them, you've got to get good at colouring, right? Because that's all that anyone ever does in a primary school, right? <laughs> colouring. So how good is your colouring? You need to, I would suggest to you, young people, you can do this, right? Get your Bible out. I've coloured in green all the way through Daniel chapter 11, the word stand. Now, don't do it now because you won't listen to me, right? But do it afterwards. Take the time to do it. And you'll see that this Hebrew word is used 43 times through the book of Daniel and 20 times here in Daniel chapter 11. So look, verse 1. Also, I, the, the first year of Darius the Mead, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. Uh, Michael says, and now will I show you the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. Verse 3, a mighty king shall stand. Don't worry, you're not going to do all 20. Verse 4, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be given. And so on and so forth. But what we're going to see outworking through the chapter is the various powers that the angels orchestrate in standing. Because it is God who's in control of the kingdoms of men. In fact, there's a lovely point around this idea of this standing. Because the first time we read this word in the book of Daniel is unsurprisingly in chapter 1. Just come back to chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1... Where is Daniel standing? Verse 4. We read that the, uh, the, the Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, brought in children, verse 4, of whom was no blemish, but were well favoured and skilled in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge, understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand, where? In the king's palace. 
And verse 5, that the king appointed for them a daily portion of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Verse 19, and the king communed with them, that's the, uh, the, the uh, prince of the eunuchs, and Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And at the end of verse 19, they stood, that's the same word, before the king. So do you see that the story begins of the book of Daniel, of Daniel having to stand before the king. But look how it finishes tomorrow's reading, Daniel chapter 12. Last verse. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 13. The angel says to Daniel, But go thou thy way till the end be. For thou shalt rest. You're, you're going to fall asleep, Daniel. But you'll stand in your lot at the end of the days. And so there's something beautiful, isn't there, about that? That this book shows us a man living in the, the realm of Babylon, to become the Medes and the Persians' territory, who starts having to stand before the king Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And yet because that man stays focused on the truth, his end will be, it isn't yet, it's for a time appointed. As yet he, he's on sleep, he's sleeping in the dust of the earth. But at the appointed time, he will be raised from the dust of the earth and he will stand in his lot. And in between times, the angels work. And each day, the angels are working in our lives and across the kingdoms of men as God gives it to whomsoever he will. And sometimes we look on and we can hardly get our minds around what's happening in the world. We look across the ocean and we see a character that is an unseemly individual, it's fair to say, I think. And yet that person has done the most extraordinary things in relation to the land of Israel. Because God is in control of the kings of men and he gives it to whomsoever he will to bring about his purpose in relation to to the land of Israel. Now come back just a couple of pages to chapter 11, where we read this beautiful phrase in verse 2. Now will I show you the truth. Now that phrase is almost a repetition of chapter 10 and verse 21. Where we read, but I will show you, the angel says to Daniel, that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Now when I show you the truth, I'll show you that which is noted in the scripture of truth. You see, the more sure word of prophecy that we've got here is the guarantee of the scripture of truth. And you know, I think it's perhaps worrying that we don't necessarily do as much as we ought to around prophecy. Or we may have individuals that say, oh, you know, prophecy's not for me. You know, that's not for me. It, it's the more sure word of prophecy which shows us the truth of the scriptures. So I don't think it's for us to say whether it's for us or not for us. It's for all of us. You think of those faithful Jews living in the land, before the Lord Jesus Christ came, watching carefully the kings of the north and the kings of the south, knowing that God was in control of the kings of men, even in a period of absolute darkness. Now will I show you the truth. And the truth in our chapter is that following three kings of Persia, there stood up a mightier one, I think is Artaxerxes, and he would stir up against the realm of Greece and a mighty king would stand up 
of the realm of Greece. Boys and girls, can you tell me who a mighty king of Greece was? A great king of Greece. An extra clue there. A really great king. Are you all thinking of Alexander the Great? I suspected you were. <laughs> Very good, right? So, look, you've got to make a note in your margin, right? Boys and girls, get a note in your margin. Next to verse 3, a mighty king shall stand up, Alexander the Great. That shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. And shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. And not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. And many of you will know the course of history. That at 33, this young man died. Alexander the Great. He died. And his kingdom wasn't given to his son. For a period it was given to his brother. But that didn't work out very well. And there were four generals that were Alexander's successors, which we see there on the screen. The Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and Lysimachus. And we see there the, the division of the Greek kingdom. And the history books attest to this happening exactly in the detail that the scriptural record lays out. But I want you to notice something here, that it says to us in verse 4 that the kingdom wouldn't be to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. Now that word dominion is not used very often in scripture. In fact, it's used on three occasions. It's the Hebrew word moshel. They're there on the screen, used on three occasions. And they're of interest to us in our study. So keep a marker, but would you first come with me to Job 41? In Job chapter 41, you know that we read about Leviathan, the great sea monster. And Leviathan is used as a metaphor for sin. And our word, Job 41 and verse 33 is actually the word like in the authorised version. So it says, upon earth there is not his like. Upon earth there is not one that has his dominion. Who is made without fear, he beholdeth all high things. He's a king over all the children of pride. He's king sin. Right? So Leviathan is a metaphor for king sin that has dominion over all the earth. On the earth is not his like. That's what sin is able to do. King sin has dominion over the things of the earth. He's a king over all the children of pride. Now, come with me to Zechariah. Our, our other reference we put on the screen there, we've obviously seen already in Daniel chapter 11. But come to Zechariah chapter 9, and as you're turning there, think to yourself, why would it be of interest to us that this word is used in Zechariah chapter 9? And the answer I'll give you as you're turning it up, and many of you will already have it in your minds, is that Zechariah 9 is divided in two parts. The first is verses 1 to 8, and the second is verse 9 to 17. And Zechariah 9 verses 1 to 8 is about which major Greek king? Alexander the Great. Right? So Zechariah 9, you, you'll, you'll all know, know, I'm sure, you need to make a note if you don't. Zechariah 9, 1 to 8, it's about Alexander the Great. But, however great a king he was, however magnificent he looked riding on his horse, Bucephalus, there would come a king with great humility. A king not with all the pomp of Alexander, but lowly and riding upon an ass. Verse 9, Zechariah chapter 9. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you. It's not Alexander the Great. He's just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fall of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the heathen. And his, is our word, dominion shall be from sea even to sea and from the rivers even to the ends of the earth. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ would be greater than the dominion shown by Alexander the Great, no matter how powerful and swift that leopard was, that goat that moved across the Middle Eastern territories. This king would be greater than Alexander. In fact, this king would defeat King Sin and totally destroy the one that had dominion on the earth over the children of pride. And so when we come back to Daniel, we can be confident that for all we're going to read, there is going to come one far greater than the kings of the Greeks, the kingdoms of the north and of the south. And what we see in our chapter now is the record focusing on the individuals occupying the territories to the north and to the south of the land of Israel. That's critical to us. That we're, that, that's who we're focused on. We're focused on the people who are north and south of Israel. Because it is Israel that it is that our God witnesses. God has said, I want you to look at that land to see that I'm working in the earth today. And so if our minds are focused on Israel, we'll see the actions of the king of the north and the king of the south. And, and in our chapter, we see, as we said, the most exceptional and extraordinary details, which we're not about to go through. You can take these slides and, and look at them uh, in, in detail afterwards. That's just to give you a picture on the screen of the detail that these chapters show of the outworking of history, particularly between the, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, the Seleucids in the north and the Ptolemies in the south. And then the chapter starts to focus on a particular individual, the king of the north at the time, in verse 21. Daniel is going to be shown in exceptional detail the characteristics and the movements of a vile person. The revised version says a contemptible person. To whom they shall not give the honour of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And we read about this king, incredible detail, and we read a particular phrase that's used about Antiochus Epiphanes. In verse 27, we read that both these kings, so Antiochus went to be with the king of the south, heart shall be to do mischief, they lie to each other, they, they shall speak lies at one table, that's exactly what happened, but it won't prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So for all the scheming and surmisings of the king of the north, this time with the king of the south, round the table, their plans will not come to anything. Because, at the end of verse 27, it is not the end of the time appointed. Now that is a critical phrase for us. We, we, we see it again used in verse 20, 29. 
at the time appointed. Now, we're interested in this phrase. We shall pick it up just together shortly. I just want us to read, though, from verse 29 down to verse 32 again. So at the time appointed, he, Antiochus Epiphanes, shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former as the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Another power is rising up. Antiochus Epiphanes has had great sway from his throne in the king of the north territory. And he's had it all his own way, even when meeting with the king of the south. But now a greater power is going to start to emerge. The ships of Shittim are going to come against him. And we perhaps have a note in our margin, Rome. The Romans are going to emerge. And we're not surprised because we know Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. That after the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks would come the Romans. The ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Shall he do, and he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So he's going to work with people, with the Jewish people, that would be prepared to forsake the truth. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, try to put some details for us here on the slides, we see that uh, in the first instance there, in verse 31, that Antioch's army was, it, it suppressed the, the daily sacrifice that was taking place by the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. History attests that this is exactly what took place. And moreover, because he was so furious, he was grieved with indignation against the Jewish people, he did worse than that. He set up the abomination that maketh desolate. And what he did is he, in Jerusalem, he introduced the, the, the cult of Zeus um, into their temple worship. And, and we read on in verse 32 that, And such as do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by factories. In other words, what he's going to do He's work with the Jews. He's going to try to win over the high priests at the time to, to win them to be on his side and to worship in a way that is so different from what the God of Israel would want. But, verse 32, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And again, the history books tell us of the Maccabees, of the Jewish people at the time who didn't want to enter into any sort of covenant with Antiochus Epiphanes. They could see that what he was doing was so wrong before the God of Israel that they rebelled against his rule and they were strong, albeit just for a while, and they did great exploits and you look at the history of the Maccabees, you see some extraordinary stories about their conflict as they stood up for what they felt was the truth against Antiochus Epiphanes. I want us to just refer back to that key phrase in verse 27. The end shall be at the time appointed. Verse 29, the time Appointed. Verse 35, some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it's yet for a time appointed. And brethren and sisters, what comes out of the here is that for all the machinations of men's hearts, the angels are in control allowing the king of the north and the king of the south to fight at war against each other over the territory of the Holy Land. And yet in all that, there are faithful men and women, those who are wise. Just look verse 33. They, they that understand, that's, that's the same word, are wise, 
among the people shall instruct many. Yea, they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall, to try them, to purge, to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it's for a time appointed. And so God is saying that for everything we see taking place on the earth, there is a time appointed. I want us just to go to Hebrews chapter 11. Keep a marker here in Daniel 11. But come to Hebrews chapter 11. We read in verse 3, words we know well, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Now, that could be translated slightly differently. We could read, through faith we understand that the worlds were adjusted, or the ages, is that the Greek word there, the ages were adjusted by the word of God. And in other words, the point is this, time is God's time. That it's God who's working. He's in control of the ages and adjusts them to bring about his purpose according to his will. Now, another key phrase, come to Acts chapter 17, that picks up on the time appointed. You know well, Acts 17 verse 30 and 31, that at the times of this ignorance God winked at he overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness. God is in control. He's adjusting the ages, but he's appointed a day. And Daniel chapter 11, that phrase that's coming out of the time appointed, is telling us, as it was telling the believers, there is an appointed day, that will be the time of the end. Just come to Psalm 102. They're all good references to have in Daniel chapter 11. Psalm 102. Verse 12, but thou, O Lord, shall endure forever thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favour her, yet the set time is come. Now, there are words that we have in Daniel chapter 11, the exact same Hebrew words being used there, of the appointed time. The time to favour her, the appointed time is come. So there will come a time, the appointed time, when Zion will be favoured. It wasn't yet in Daniel chapter 11. Before we go back there, just come finally with me in this section to Revelation. To Revelation chapter 10. Revelation 10, another amazing chapter that sets out for us the imagery of the rainbowed angel. And we hope this is us when we will march with the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints through the, angel, through the ages up to Zion to give to Zion the appointed time. But there's a lovely phrase here that I think is key to what we're looking at where we read that the angel has to say at a certain point in history, the end of verse 6, that there should be time no longer. And brethren and sisters, I think that's sobering. Because we live in the days, which we're going to look at particularly in our second address, where that angel could make that sound at any moment. It could be tonight. We might not get to our second address. 
Some of you look pleased to hear that. <laughs> well, you would be, wouldn't you? If the angel gave the signal, <coughs> time no more. It's up. It's like the final whistle. And that time is going to come very shortly. For those living in the time of Daniel chapter 11, they were told the end time is not yet. They knew that Messiah had not yet come. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. They just had to hang in there, looking to the north, looking to the south. At the king of the north and the king of the south, warring between the lands. To know that the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the God of their scriptures was still in control of world events. So come back to Daniel chapter 11. Just bring our thoughts together on this section here. <clears throat> to understand, just as an exhortational point, in any period of history, what is the role of those of us who understand these things? Verse 33, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. How are the preaching activities in your ecclesia? If we are those who understand. And let me tell you now, we are. Right? This is us. Those who understood had to instruct many. Are you involved in the Sunday school in your ecclesia? Are you involved in correspondence, perhaps CIL correspondence, with other children? Trying to teach them. Are you perhaps corresponding with brothers and sisters in far off lands. Who need support in knowing the truth. Are you supporting out with the CYC. Do you see. Brothers are you studying to give a Bible class. It's, it's not. It's not an option for us brothers and sisters. If we are the wise. There's an expectation. That we should be instructing, telling others about the gospel message, about the God of Israel, showing them how God is working in the kings of men today. The faithful Jews in this time were telling the others, don't go along with the thinking of Antiochus Epiphanes. Are we telling people not to go along with the thinkings of the world today? So this is our role, to instruct and to teach many. And then we notice there's a change in verse 36. Because no longer are we told, between verse 36 and 39, of the king of the south and the king of the north. Young people, you'll be able to see this, I'm sure. The king shall do according to his will. What does it say? It doesn't say, the king of the... North, the king of the south. You see, a king is going to come now. The one who challenged Antiochus Epiphanes with the ships of Shittim. Who is going to do according to his will. There's going to be a great and powerful kingdom over the region. Not set in the territory just north or just south. But over all of that territory of Rome. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods. This, of course, is the system of Rome. And out of the system of Rome came the Roman Catholic Church. Headed by a man who sees himself... As God on earth. As the Father. The Pope. Papa. A man who exalts himself and magnifies himself above every God. And of course, 
pagan Rome, before it was uh, uh, turned into Christian Rome, to, to the Catholic system, uh, worshipped many gods. And so he magnified himself above every god. But he speaks marvellous things against the God of gods. And I'm sure you'll have references there back to Daniel chapter 7, where we see the little horn speaking blasphemous words uh, against the God of gods. Neither, verse 37, shall he regard the gods of his father, nor the desire of women, nor reg regard any god. So... <laughs> After Constantine, Rome abandoned the idols, didn't they? And they didn't worship the gods of their fathers. No, 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 they didn't bother with pagan gods. No, no, no. But they served a trinity, didn't they? Uh, and it became a huge money-making system, the Roman Catholic Church. In his estate shall he honour the god of forces, a god whom his fathers knew not, shall he honour with gold, with silver, with precious stones, and with pleasant things. And even today, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, is extraordinarily well, wealthy. The money that it collects through the church system that feeds into the Vatican and into the papacy itself. And so we see in these last verses the system of Rome emerge, which is exactly what we'd expect when we reflect back on Daniel chapter 2 at the most simple of Daniel's prophecies, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, where we saw the head of gold, chest and the arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron. Here we're now shown the legs of iron, the Roman system. And it's this system that we see even today working in the <coughs> kingdoms of men. This is the system that was the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. It's the beast of Daniel chapter 7 that treads down the saints of the Most High. It's the system that blasphemes the God of Heaven, that speaks against Him. And it's the system we see in one of the final prophecies of the Bible, in Revelation 17, where we see the beast system of Daniel showing us the territory of Europe. But on that beast is a rider. And that rider is the false prophet of Revelation 16. It's the king who exalts himself and magnifies himself above every god of Daniel chapter 11. But in Revelation 17, we're told specifically that the harlot, that's the apostate church, would ride the beast, the European system coming out of Rome. What do we see today? Well, just in May this year, in February actually this is, can Pope Francis save Europe? As the world looks on and sees Great Britain trying to get out, Europe needs direction. They can't look the United States any longer. And so as Europe tries to find itself and find its identity, it needs a rider. And they're looking at the false prophet. They're looking at the harlot. They're looking at the king who would do according to his will and exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and speak marvellous things against the god of gods. They're looking to him to ride the beast. This is May of this year. As Europe votes, the Pope wages a quiet campaign for its soul. And that article went on to say that though usually styled as a Pope of the peripheries, Francis has never made a speech directly sketching out a social and political future for, say, Asia or Africa. Yet when it comes to Europe, He's laid out such a vision on five separate occasions. That's extraordinary. An extraordinary thing to be reading. The commentators are noting this year that this man, who's not even from Europe, in fact recently he was given a prize where they said, you're like the greatest European. Because he's the rider. 
He's the rider that is climbing on that system of Rome as he tries to tether it and to ride it to set the nations up against the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints when they come. And yet in all of this, we're told, aren't we, in the end of verse 36, that this rider, this king, won't have it all his own way. He will have it until, he'll prosper until the indignation be accomplished. For that is determined, shall be done. He'll, he'll do it until God says, that's enough. The time appointed has come. Now, I just want you to notice, I put on the screen there, trying to be helpful, some words that are used, interestingly, um, and unusually together in Isaiah 10 that reflect our Daniel 11 passage. So we are bringing our thoughts to a close, but will you come to, Dan to, to Isaiah chapter 10? Because Isaiah 10 is an amazing chapter that talks to us of the latter-day Assyrian, the king of the north, right? And it talks to us of the Assyrian in the days of Isaiah and the latter-day Assyrian that would come, which actually will be the Gogian power that will come. But of course, our chapter's been about the king of the north and the king of the south. And here we see that the in Isaiah 10, what would happen to the king of the north. And so we'll just go in in verse 20, uh, verse 20 for connection. It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped to the house of Jacob shall no more stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of the land. We can keep reading, verse 24, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian, of the king of the north. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt, the king of the south, for yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. And so Israel are told that for all that is happening between the king of the north and the king of the south, you hold on to the truth. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease cease. And we live in these days when in just a very little while the time will come. Turn finally to Habakkuk. You know these words well, brothers and sisters. And we're reminded of the time appointed. So what does the wise have to do? They have to instruct many. And so Habakkuk, verse 2, has to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run, that reads it. Are we making it plain for other people? For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the end it shall but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The Septuagint uh, translates the it as he. Though he tarry, wait for him, because he will surely come. He will not tarry. Behold. His soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. And so for us in the time that we're given, 
until the angel declares, time no longer. We've got to use it faithfully because the just will live by faith. We've got to hold on to the message of the truth. We've got to reflect on the men and women living in a time of great darkness that could only look to the north and to the south to know that God was working in their lives. We are given the most exceptional and extraordinary time, signs of the times, which we will look at in our, our second address. Surely, in our days, when we see these things taking place before our eyes, we can hold fast to this more sure word of prophecy and we can live each day by faith.